showing us your teeth here at Dragging It Out. In this episode, we're going to jump straight into the format of a RuPaul Drag Race episode. So we're just going to jump straight in and we are going to start with the opening. So the queens come in and they basically stand around the pink table and have a wee chat. They have a dig usually at somebody. If they've got a bit of beef, they try and sort it out. And then Rue sounds the alarm, does a Nicki Minaj, sounds the alarm, and they all start screaming, Woo! and they all run to their retrospective places. So away they go, away they go, they trot, 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 and he comes in with his uh, suits, uh, Kleinstein and Parker suits or something like that. Each individually made, never see him in the same suit twice, ever. And he basically sets the assignment. So every week they start with a mini challenge. So the mini challenge can be anything. And sometimes they need to get into quick drag, which is about 15, 20 minutes. Never longer than that, usually. And they do the challenge. So whoever wins the challenge usually gets an advantage. So the advantage could be they get 15 seconds to start picking something from something that the pit crew's brought in if it's a sewn challenge, or they get first dibs on people if it's a team challenge, or sometimes it's nothing. It just depends what the main challenge is. So, depending on the challenge, uh, depending on the main challenge, what happens then is whoever wins the mini challenge gets the advantage. So, the main challenges for UK seems to follow in a certain format. So, for the very first episode, it is about getting to know the queens and that seems to be about where they come from, which is represented by their town. So, for instance, um, if you come from... So, for instance, Lawrence Cheney, who was a Glaswegian queen, Like, people would expect her to do tartan or something like that, but she actually did Charles Rennie Macintosh, which was great, obviously. Um, and Ellie Diamond was from Dundee, and she did Dennis Menace. So, things like that. Brighton seems to sort of fail on this one. <laughs> Brighton seems to have a curse on it for some reason, and Brighton Queens seem to go home first. They broke that curse, I think, in season three or season four, only because there was two Brighton queens in it. So one of them stayed and one of them went, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, the first challenge seems to be about getting to know them. So they always do two looks. So it's about um, the town that they came from. And I think the very, very first challenge was like 100 years of the BBC. So it was... Uh, about the Queen. So it was like a, a look of the Queen or something like that. But other main challenges always include a sewing challenge. So it is amazing the amount of Queens that go on RuPaul's Drag Race that can't sew. Now, if you get the invitation to say that you're going on RuPaul's Drag Race, you would take a sewing lesson, right? Even if it's just one. To me, you would always take one sewing lesson, right, to, to sew, like, a basic dress. But there's still queens that go on there and rely on a hot glue gun. And there is queens that have went on the American one, no sewing experience, used a hot glue gun and made masterpieces. Ben de la Creme done it. She made an absolute masterpiece of a dress with a hot glue gun. Stunning. 
get to see a stunning gown with a hot glue gun in a UK, but I mean, there's still time. Um, th so there's always a sewing challenge, always an acting challenge. Not everybody's an actor, actress. Um, but you don't always have to have the main part to stand out. So you can have the smallest part in the world and be like steal the show. We've seen it done many times uh, in the UK, so uh, in America. So these queens that moan about having the smallest part understand that they want to stand out if they've obviously had a bad week the week before and things like that. But um, you'll always have a rusical challenge. So rusicals that have been done in the past have been like rats the rusical. Um, that was actually quite a good one. Um, that's the only one that actually stands out just now. I can't think what the other one. Oh, Lady Poppins was obviously a take on Mary Poppins. Um, there'll always be a girl group challenge. Always, always, always. So they had, in season one, they had the Frock Destroyers. So they come up with their own band name. Um, but the song is always given to them by Rue. So it's usually always written by uh, Leland as one of Rue's writers. So it's usually him that writes them. So it was Break Up Bye Bye. Um, and that was won by the Frog Destroyers. In season two, it was the song was called UK Hun. Um, and it was won by the United King Dolls. Um, and Rosie Ramsey um actually sang that to her wee boy after he was born as a lullaby. Um in season three, it was Big Drag Energy, so it was BDE, um, and there was two versions of that, so that was the first year that they did two versions, so they did a drag version and they did a ballad version, and obviously nobody wanted the ballad version, but it was actually that version that won. Um, and then in season four, the song was called Come Alive, and it was Queens of the Bone Age that won it. Um, so they're all on Spotify, but I'll put them in the description. Um, for you um, so there's always always a girl group challenge so there's a dance challenge there can be a comedy challenge there used to be makeover challenges um, in the first season there was the mums of the contestants that were left um, that got made over and then the second and third year was locked down, so they didn't do them in there. And then in the fourth season, there is a team called the Queen Team in RuPaul's Drag Race, which are a group of women who help get the queens ready. So, like, tighten the corsets and obviously make sure their wigs are on properly and things like that. So it's a team that you never, ever see. So they're behind the scenes, they do absolutely everything. So it's like the mums and the sisters of basically the, the queens that are participating who are there to support them in anything that they need and things like that. So Rue seen it as a way to give back to them kind of thing. And the, the queen team were predominantly part of the LGBTQI community. So it was nice for them to obviously be on the other side of obviously drag kind of thing. So it was lovely to see uh, them obviously having that experience and things like that. So season five, I wonder if they'll have another makeover challenge since they never had one in two or three. Uh, you'll always have Snatch Game which is um, like, I want to say blankety blank, so it's like Rue will ask a question like 
so and so ha uh, has made a new perfume and it's called and they'll ask the the people who are playing the game so it's usually like guest judges uh, or like guests of the show what did they call it and then it's got to match with the queens, but the queens are impersonating other people. So this is their opportunity to be someone else. So like last season, Danny Bear did Silla Black. So he is Lover Puddling. So you'd be thinking that would be an easy character for him to do. I'll say no more. Um, Cheddar Gorgeous did Mary Queen of Scots because nobody really knows what they're like. Um, John Blur's Blonde did um, St. Paddy's or St. Aha uh-huh, St. Paddy's, so it was like St. Patrick's sister, and because obviously nobody knows what they're like. Um, somebody else did uh, her that does all the tidying and things like that. Oh, all the organizing and things, I, um, but you get you get what I mean, like the the impersonate other people kind of thing. So, if you win snatch game, in drag race, it's usually a big thing. Like that's usually an indication of who the front runners are in RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, you'll always have a grand finale, and the. The main runway is usually eleganza extravaganza, and the like. The judges for that is usually like family only. So your panel is always RuPaul, Michelle Visage, Alan Carr, or Graham Norton. So they two switch out, and then you'll have the spin off. So whoever wins obviously has their own spin off. But to decide who's always going home, you'll always have the two bottom queens and they lip sync for their life. So Jimmy Fallon and all that have all, all done the lip sync thing, but it originated from RuPaul's Drag Race. So they will lip sync for their life to a song of RuPaul's choosing. So the only time queens get access to technology, because obviously the phones and all that are taken off them as soon as they enter the competition, is when they need to lip sync. So when they go into the workroom after the judges' critiques, that's when they are given a iPad or um a what do you call it a Walkman a Walkman iPod or whatever to listen to the song that they need to lip sync to kind of thing. So that's the format. So they go in, they have a bitch. The alarm goes, they do the mini challenge. Whoever wins mini challenge usually gets an advantage. And then they do the main challenge, whatever that is. And then they get told what the main main stage topic is. And then they basically walk, walk the runway. Like I said in the previous episode, we'll walk it twice. We only see it once, obviously, with the music and the commentary. And then the bottom two queens will obviously lip sync for their life and then Rue picks who Shanty stays and who sashays away. And then we do it all again. Um, there is different queens in the competition. So you've got your camp queens, which are obviously, I suppose, like your panto dames and things like that. You've got your fashion queens who are very on point, painted like beyond belief, painted as in their faces, absolutely immaculate. Um, you've got your comedy queens who are very ha ha. Um, and then you've got your, we call them clown queens, but they are very different, so they can be like, they can be a clown, like they can be a, a like a funny ha ha clown, or they could be like horror scary, 
or they could be like monster or they could be furry or they could just be different but then in terms of queens not all queens are gay men so the majority of drag queens are gay men that is what makes up the the majority of drag queens but you've also got straight men who do drag so in America there's one who's been on RuPaul's Drag Race called Maddie Morphosis um, he has a podcast called Give It To Me Straight which is a brilliant name for a podcast um, He and it was RuPaul that called him out in front of the workroom he hadn't told the rest of the queens that he was straight um, a couple of the queens knew um, and he was like, as if I wanted to tell them and you've just called me out. But obviously, trip off show, he could do what he likes. In season one, there was a, a young queen came in. He was only 19. His name was Scared the Cat. And he was 19, like I said, and he was bisexual. And he had a girlfriend. And the girlfriend was also a drag queen. So that was the first bisexual drag queen to come in. And then you've got bearded queens. So that was Danny Baird in season four. He was the first bearded queen to come in to RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, and then we had in season two a queen from a traveller background, a travelling background. Um, Cherry Valentine and she brought out a documentary um, I'll talk about that more in season 2 um, and oh sorry it's called Gypsy Queen and Proud it's on BBC iPlayer um, and in that documentary, she says that when she came into RuPaul's Drag Race, she had no intention of saying that she was a traveller because of the stigma attached to being a traveller, being gay, but also being a drag queen. And her day job was a mental health nurse. And after she did that, documentary obviously she was eliminated from the competition she did the documentary and then on the 23rd of September 2022 there was a statement released to say that George Cherry Valentine had passed away and it was an absolute shock to the community and it just was very, very difficult considering considering the profession she was in, um, and watching her or watching her on the program and then watching that documentary, you could uh, you could sort of understand the challenges and the difficulties she had as both Cherry and and George. Um, so when you watch the programme, their backgrounds and what they deal with is not necessarily easy. Um, and it isn't always easy in, in the LGBTQIA community. Um, but that was that was really really heartbreaking. And um, if you ever get a chance to watch that documentary, uh, please do. Um, another queen who made history in RuPaul's Drag Race 
was Victoria Scon, and she was in season three of RuPaul's Drag Race, and she is a cis woman doing drag, which is unusual, I suppose, in the sense that the majority of people think it's only men that do drag or it, it's only allowed to be men that do drag, if you know what I mean. Um, she, uh, the, uh, when she walked into the, the workroom, everybody knew who Victoria Scone was and everybody was like, oh, it's Victoria Scone, Victoria Scone kind of thing. And unfortunately, she injured herself in one of the very first episodes, I think it was episode two or three, um, and they had to pull her out, basically. And what happens then is usually they get an extended invitation to come back, but that didn't happen on this occasion. But what did happen was she then went on to Canada versus the world in 2022 um, and she got to the final, basically. Uh, and then, which was amazing, and she then made history again because she proposed to her then girlfriend uh, at the finale, uh, Danny, at the time. And uh, yeah, and Danny said yes, and and then unfortunately split up. But yeah, so that was the reason why she wasn't invited back because obviously she had Rue had different plans for her basically to do obviously the other franchise. So so yeah, so there's different queens. So there's camp, fashion, comedy, clown. Um, and then you've got queens with all different backgrounds. So obviously traveller queens, um, bisexual queens, cis queens, bearded queens, um, so many other queens. Like that. It's not until the episodes go on and on and on and you obviously hear so, so much about them and you fall in love with them. Like in America, like there's chicken farmers and there's... Um, like chicken farmer just came to mind there, obviously, like just because fame, like you would never, never know that she was a chicken farmer, like just be looking at her because she's like absolutely painted like to the gods kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's just it, it's just amazing how it just changes, and then they've obviously all got first impressions when they walk in if they don't know them and things like that um, and then as obviously the episodes go on it changes, their perception of each other changes episode uh, season 3 uh, Vanity Milan was the only um, queen of colour and she made the point of that in the very first episode that Obviously, diversity was not represented, and it was very funny because in uh, season four, there was a uh, three or three queens of a uh, color represented in season four. So, don't know if uh, that was addressed or not, but it was a bit of a coincidence. So, yeah. And it's not to say that uh, there wasn't any audition tapes in season three that uh, didn't have that, but yeah, I mean, Vanity did so well, but she felt immense pressure to represent that community. Um, and she then went on to Canada versus the world where she was with Raja O'Hara and Silky Nutmeg Ganache from America and they absolutely slayed the girl group challenge because the three of them were in a group together. 
first time in uh, RuPaul's history as well, where there's been a girl group made up of obviously three girls um, like that as well. So, I mean, it was just, it was just amazing. Um, so, yeah, but obviously lip syncs are famous around the world and that's what drag queens do day in, day out. That is their daily bread and butter. You will hear them say, if I need to lip sync all the way through this competition, that's what I'll just do, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you go on, girl, that's what you do. If that's what you need to do all the way through that competition. But if you've not got a badge, when you hit that final you will like when you hit near that final, you will be not going to the final. And we've seen that with Ellie Diamond in season three. Um, she was one step near the final and she didn't have a badge and she didn't get the final and she done immense, but she was up against girls who all had badges. So I don't know if that was Rue's thinking or whatever. What you'll also find in RuPaul's Drag Race is you'll always seem to find an educator in each of the groups. So you'll always have that one queen who has obviously loads and loads and loads and loads of experience who's been doing drag since day dot. You'll have queens who've been doing it for six months and just have has caught Ru's eye on that addition tape or whatever. But you have a queen who just knows things about everything, I suppose, um, who's been through the HIV epidemic, who's been through or, or knows about Stonewall or who knows about... Um, why they did this or why they did that or... Just just things that other people don't know, if you know what I mean, or nuggets of information, if you know what I mean. And everybody just stops and listens, right? So in season one, Davina De Campo was the fountain of knowledge. In season two, I don't know if there was really one. Um, because lockdown happened so season two was a bit disjointed because it stopped for production and then they all came back but I'll, I'll go into the different seasons individually in different episodes season three it would have been Victoria Scone not going to lie because obviously when she went into Canada versus the world it was her that was the fountain of knowledge um, so it would have been her in season three. And then in season four, it's Cheddar Gorgeous. She was a fountain of knowledge. Um, she was the queen from Day Dot, if you know what I mean. She had been about for so long. And um, there's actually two. Well, I say two in season five, but probably... Probably one that's probably been about most and probably got the most knowledge, I would say. Um so yeah, so you've got you've got different types of queens, if you know what I mean. You've got baby queens and then you've got queens that maybe have been about so long that um they're just in their own wee bubble. But you'll find that out. For yourself if you don't already know that area and everybody's got their own favorites um so yeah so i hope that helps sort of gives you a format of the episode so that was it uh, i'm going to say it was a quick run through it's not because it's just me obviously babbling but um yeah so for me like i love the girl group challenges because you see, you see the cat come out, like you, you see that that's when the competition to me really starts, like, because they all want to put their stamp on it. They only get a limited amount of time to say what they want to say about themselves. And 
the lyrics just they need to like put their stamp on it kind of thing um, and neither can spit the words out that they can't and the live ones sometimes the rusicals are live and that can have them shaking in their boots a bit and mm, not good some of them not good because they don't do live majority of drag queens performances are lip sync if they do do live that's amazing majority of them that go on drag race probably don't um and the competition's getting stiffer and stiffer every single year and i would say it's not all about looks now and i think that is where Crystal Versace sort of changed everything. But we'll go into that in another episode. So I hope you enjoyed that set up um, episode. And I think we'll go back to the very beginning for season one. So hope you enjoy it. Bye. <laughs>